Welcome to episode 15 of the Argue With Me podcast. In this episode, I have a very special guest named Robin Hansen, a professor of economics from George Mason University. Um, professor Hansen wrote a book called The Age of M, which I had read several years ago and really loved. I recommend everybody check it out. Uh, the premise of the book, I mean, it's a piece of futurism, so it's not um, a, a piece of fiction. It's his uh, attempt to figure out what the future looks like when um, AI scientists choose to model the human brain as their uh, chosen way of achieving artificial general intelligence. So he comes up with many counterintuitive uh, conclusions um, by thinking about uh, that model and applying things we know about economics, physics, and other um, uh, disciplines. And we discuss um, whether the latest sort of versions of artificial intelligence that are out there, the neural network types, have altered his uh, predictions about the future. We discuss um, what the future will look like for human beings, uh, whether um, there should be a market for AI uh, insurance um, in the event that AI takes all of our jobs and makes us useless. Um, so yeah, I, I hope you enjoy the conversation. We really touch um, a lot of different subjects, but uh, all of it uh, stems from this idea that perhaps the most reasonable way to go about making artificial general intelligence would be to start by uh, modeling the human brain. Uh, enjoy. All right, welcome to the Argue With Me podcast. I'm delighted to have with me author Robin Hansen, uh, author of the book uh, The Age of M, which we're going to be uh, discussing. Uh, we'll discuss the book, the uh, sort of uh, overview of the book, but also what implications uh, it might have on things that are happening uh, since the book was written. Um, uh, so, uh, Rob, when was the book written? About 2016? 2016, I think. Ah, yeah, ah, it was right. Okay, good. I had a good guess there. Yeah, so... Um, the book's still highly relevant. I recommend anybody listening, go check it out. If you're interested in this conversation, I'll definitely put a link to it in the uh, notes to this video. Um, so I, I thought maybe a natural, um, spot to start, um, would be, I could just hand, uh, the mic over to you to, uh, let, let the viewers know roughly what the thesis of your book is. Would that be okay? Sure. All right. So at a meta level, my claim is it's possible to do futurism. That is, it's possible to take a particular future technology and then think through the social consequences. Many people don't believe that's possible and they claim it's not possible. So there are many tech futurists who think you can figure out technologies, but then social consequences, nobody knows anything there. So whatever thoughts pop into their head on that are just as good as anybody's and they're happy to tell you whatever thoughts pop into their head. So I am resisting that style. And I want to say social science exists. It is possible to give social consequences for technologies. And this is an existence proof. I take a very particular technology that many people have discussed over the years. And I try to show just how much I can say about what the social consequence of that technology is. And many people have complained there's too much detail. And they'd rather have that detail in a story or something else. And the point is, well, that's the cost of trying to prove just how much detail I can say. So. The particular technology I introduce is whole brain emulation. So that's the idea where we take particular human brains and we scan them and find spatial and chemical detail to see exactly which kinds of cells are where and connected to what. We take a scan and then we have a bunch of computer models of how each cell works in terms of taking signals in, changing state and signals out. And we combine that with a lot of computer hardware and the resulting combination should be a model of the brain that has the same input-output behavior. So you could hook it up with ears, eyes, hands, mouth. You could talk to it, ask it to do things. It would talk back, maybe do things, just like the original human would in the same situation. That's the idea. It's an input-output model that does the same as the original human would. That doesn't mean it always does what you want. <laughs> but you can deal with them the way you would have dealt with a human. Now, it doesn't stay just like the original human. Over time, it lives in a new world and has new experiences, and that will change uh, what it does and likes to do and in the habit of doing. And 
we know a lot about humans and how they behave. And so we can use all the things we know about humans to think about what happens in this new world. So the, the key differences are there are these things that substitute for human that act just like human, but they're made out of artificial hardware. So we can make a lot of them. We can run them fast or slow. We can put them in new environments. We can delete them. We can make copies. Uh, we can mess with them in a bunch of ways. And that's all you need to figure out how the whole society changes. And that's what I try to do. I try to show you a whole new different civilization based on these key assumptions that we have this technology. It's cheap enough to be adopted and we do adopt it. All right. So uh, first I wanted to say, I, I don't think there's too much detail in the book. I think the detail is the fun. It's the entire point of the exercise, right? So I, I thought well, that I was, thought so, but <laughs> <laughs> that was what was interesting about the book. Anybody can say, hey, we're going to scan a human brain, but like, what are the consequences? That's the fun. So, um, okay. So, but I, I wanted to ask a, a more basic question too, which is like, um, uh, why would we bother to do that rather than build AI from ground up, let's say? Well, uh, as you probably know, in the history of human technology, technologies appear whenever anybody can make them and find some use for them. We never vote on whether we want them. <laughs> There's never a civilization wide, you know, whole trial or, or analysis of whether we should adopt them. Civilization, you know, techs are adopted when somebody somewhere can adopt it and finds any reason to do so. That's how tech is adopted. So this would get adopted if anybody anywhere found a use for it. Doesn't matter whether other people don't like it. Other people think it's a net negative. That's sure. not how these things work. So the key idea is, you know, 70% roughly of world income goes to pay human workers. Oh, it's well over 60% at least. So if you can find a thing that works like a human does, but cheaper, you can make a lot of money. Right. And and I guess the idea would be like, well, we already have a model of what humans do and it's our brain. So why reinvent the, the wheel, I guess would be the point, right? Well, there are many ways in which we try to make machines that substitute for human workers on particular jobs, but it's hard to do that in many, because in many ways, machines are different for people. And the more different they are, the harder it is to figure out how to make them substitute for humans on particular things. But this kind of machine would be far more like humans than most any other machine we've ever seen. So for this, it's much easier to figure out where they could swap in for a human. Right. And I wanted to, I know we had a brief discussion and we're not really sure where this is going to go, but I want, I did want to ask you about, I know you were an AI researcher for a while as well, if, if, if you're not now, um, about, I want to ask about neural networks and large language models, because it seemed to me like, um, companies like OpenAI are sort of doing this thing where they're like, well, instead of building something from the ground up that's useful, maybe we'll just mimic neurons uh, and we'll uh, train um, these neural networks when to fire. Uh, I'm being very simplistic here um, about how this works, but um, and maybe through doing that with enough human interaction, we can get an electronic neural network to just behave like a human linguistically. Uh, is this the same vein of an idea, at least, as like the age of M? So there is a vast space of possible machine minds that could be created eventually, a vast space. And humans sit in one particular corner of that space. Hmm. And AI researchers over the decades have explored some parts of that space, trying to figure out how to make machines to do things. And more recently, there is deep learning neural net based AI, which is trained on large databases of human text and human behavior. So compared to the vast space of random minds, these minds are closer to human than a random mind out there, because again, their structure of their brains are more similar to our brains and the data on which they're trained is our behaviors. So they are much more recognizably human-like than random pieces of software or, or minds that you can construct. However, in our history over decades, when we have automated tasks, that is when we have 
constructed machines to replace humans on particular tasks, we usually start from the task and go nearby to find machine designs that could accomplish that task. And typically, most automation is actually really pretty simple. Uh, you know, deep learning is only a tiny fraction of automation still so far. So uh, there's still the question of if you start from this design of a neural net trained on data, you run demos and you are impressed. Gee, that's you know recognizably more human-like than other random things. That's inspiring and hopeful and might make you want to pursue those lines of research more. But it doesn't mean you can just swap those in for humans on random tasks. Right. Because there's just a lot more to do to do that. I mean, even today, you can't take a random human and swap it in for another random human on any job any random human is doing, right? Yeah. There's a lot of training to do. So, And that's when you have full-blown humans, right? So these things are still quite a bit different from humans. And it's still hard then to train them to do a particular task human do. They, they are doing more things that people used to do, but... We're mostly doing that opportunistically. That is, we take these systems, we play with them, we see some things we can do, and then we go, look, gee, <laughs> where could we use that? And, uh, right. you know, for example, if you're a college student right, wanting to write essays, all oh, these these things can be helpful for you, but there's not that much demand in the economy for machines to write college student essays, but um, hey, there's some. Also, if you want like a picture drawn with like specified features, and you aren't that picky about its artistic quality, why well, you can type in a few words and get a picture roughly like that. And that's pretty cool, except there's not really that much demand in the economy for that. So again, the key problem is the space of cool demos is just not very well tied to the space of things people do. And when you wanna have machines replace people on particular tasks in the economy, you have to go look at those particular tasks and find a way to make a machine do that. And that's still pretty hard. Right, so it might still, I guess then, if I could put it this way, and don't let me put it this way if I'm, if I'm wrong, but um, I guess the introduction of uh, deep learning and large language models shouldn't really affect your confidence level very much that people will still want to scan brains and uh, use that as a method of, of making uh, well, intelligence. Well, the main <laughs> question is how much farther will we go with how fast? So right. certainly many people have looked at recent AI progress and guessed that it will proceed rapidly. And then relatively soon, I don't know, in a couple of decades, it will be at a human level or frat past there. And then if we can get other kinds of AI at a broad human level soon before brain emulation, then by the time brain emulation show up, they won't have as many jobs to do. Right. But if brain emulation show up when there's relatively few tasks being done by AI, then we'll have more of the scenario I described in the book where the emulations quickly just do everything. Now, much of the scenario I described in the book plays out pretty similarly with declining fractions of what the M's do. So you might think that in my description, maybe 90% of tasks initially are being done by M's, maybe 10% still being done by humans, and you know some other small fraction being done by automation. Now let's imagine another scenario where at the moment when M's become possible, only 20% of jobs are being done by humans and 80% of jobs are being done by AI. Well, right. still, the M's are going to take over those 20%. And it'll play out much the same way, except down by a factor of five, right? Yeah. The M's will be displacing humans on the jobs that humans were doing that AI couldn't do, but it'll, the impact will be smaller because you already had AI's doing so much of the economy. And I guess who knows too. I mean, uh, an M is it's roughly human, but it's superhuman, right? And it might even start giving some advantages. The, the yeah, a view <laughs> it might giving the, start giving the pure AI uh, run for its money. In right. That. So once <laughs> humans' software are, you know, in artificial hardware, then the AI no longer has a hardware advantage over the humans. Yeah. It'll need a software advantage, and then we ask. Are we sure AI always has a software advantage? Some people assume that, but I don't think that's nearly so obvious. I think there are some places where humans will continue to have a software advantage for a long time. Yeah, I think I think that's likely. Well, I think that's actually maybe the main problem with AI is they just don't know how to do the software other than by mimicking humans. So if that's going to be the tact you take, how are you going to beat a human that has the hardware? 
Um, I, I there's mean, lots of possibilities, but we yeah. don't need to know the answer. I mean, no. so, you know, a key story I would just say is <laughs> the future is important enough that it would be worth having a hundred books on different scenarios. So yeah. if a scenario has a 1% chance that justifies writing the book on it, it doesn't need a 75% chance. <laughs> it's worth having like a 1% scenario book. Well, I, we can afford a hundred books on the subject. Absolutely. I'd, I'd like to read all of them, assuming they're well done. But I think like I, I think your book is not a 1% book. I think it's much more. I, I don't know what the percentage uh, is, but uh, given advances in brain scanning since the book was even released and the likelihood that it is easiest to develop software by aping human software, I think that it's it's um, still fairly likely that uh, uh, your emulation scenarios might happen. So the major uncertainties are about the cell modeling. That is, um, you know, scanning is proceeding rapidly and will probably be the first thing to be cheap enough. Computing is just a whole industry on its trajectory that we can easily forecast. Uh, the main question is, when will we have enough cell models that model enough fraction of the types of cells in the brain? And that's uncertain because we don't even know how many cell types there are and we're not very sure how complicated of a model for each cell type we will need. So if the models are relatively simple, then we won't need as much work to make them, and then the computers will be cheaper to run them, et cetera. But if the models are more complicated or there's more types, it'll take longer. And that's the main uncertainty in brain emulation. Right, yeah. And I think, I mean, um, generally, I think there's an underappreciation from the uh, public about how complicated human brains are compared to AI still. They're a good deal right. more, more complicated. Uh, right. so, even, but now yeah. many of the AI people, they're betting on simplicity. They think ah, intelligence has some simple, elegant theory that once you figure it out, lets you make AI. And human complexity is all just cruft and, and evolutionary spaghetti code mess. Mm. And it's not indicative of how much complexity is required to make deep intelligence because they keep hoping there's some fundamental elegant simplicity some you know 10 equations that summarize intelligence that once you know that you can have a big you know big computer system but with a relatively simple architecture that does it all right so that's part of the question is there such a thing like in biology say we have ecologies ecology are just large complicated combinations of many species together and there usually is no simple theory of them they are just intrinsically complicated, and and even or human even the organisms and biologies are pretty damn complicated. Even cells are pretty damn complicated. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the question is, is there some elemental simplicity that could cut through that? I mean, I'm betting you couldn't really make a good cell that's as functional as our cells with much less complexity. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know if you're trying to imagine ten equations to make a cell that does all the things our cells do, you can, no, that's not gonna not gonna work that way. Yeah, so I, think... I would bet toward more intrinsic complexity that is just doing well at what cells do, what bodies do, what brains do is just complicated. And to master it, you will just have to master a lot of complexity. Right. Well, and this is a nice um, uh, segue to something I, I wanted to ask you about, which is just um, I, I think you're probably right about this complexity. Uh, but I also think that anything in the universe, assuming we're living in a physical determinist universe of some kind or something roughly approximating it, it's going to have to contend with some of the same things, right? So I thought whether it was an AI or an M, more, I think we'll probably talk more about M since that's what your book is about, of course. Um, would, would you expect to see uh, competition or similar social problems to the ones that we like to talk about these days, uh, whether they're real problems or not, like uh, inequality, like, could you picture an M or an AI fighting about how much RAM they get versus another M? So <laughs> I'm an economist by profession. Right. So we have many specific theories about each of the many particular social complexities of our world, theories about why it's there and what it does. And those are the theories I would use to talk about in what other worlds would they continue. So I don't need to just ask in general some abstract estimate of how much complexity passes over, we can go one by one. 
we have many things we know about inequality and why they bother people and when they don't. And I would just use those to project into the M world. And I, in fact, do in the age of M. That's how most of the age of M book works. I take any particular issue like falling in love or needing a break in the workday or yeah. whatever it is. And I ask, what's our standard theory of that? And then I apply that standard theory to the new different world of the M's in order to say how it plays out there. So what, what do you think? Would they fight over RAM? Well, they would have conflicts where different parts of would want them. But we, you know, in our world today, there are many things I might want that other people have. That doesn't mean I fight them. <laughs> yeah. It means <laughs> I envy them, perhaps. Sure. Um, but I mean, can't, can't you see somebody going, hey, the Einstein, um, he's got 98% of the RAM over there. And I, you know, that type of thing. They'll have to come up with some way of dealing with that uh so type of issue. <laughs> interestingly, in our world today, we often have envy across individuals, but not clans. So if your great grandfather had, you know, 25 descendants and my great grandfather had 20,000 descendants. Yeah. You aren't envious of me in our world today. You're envious that I have a bigger car than you or <laughs> something like that. So our envy is really pretty specific and doesn't generalize. So we'd also don't actually envy people having longer lives that much. We might envy how much time, money they can spend per each year of life. Yeah. So our envy is, is not generic about all the things that other people might have that you might not. It's rather particular and that's how we can project envy into the M world. So actually M's will vary a lot more in terms of their clan size, how many copies of them are, but their individual per M consumption won't vary so much so that kind of inequality will be less right and, and what is i i know the answer but what is the reason why um their consumption uh, or or what 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 would their income look like in the world of m's well the key so point is that through most of human history and most of animal history most humans and animals have lived near subsistence level their population increased quickly up to the point where they're you know environment couldn't sustain much more and that limited their population sizes and in the last few centuries we've been growing wealth faster than population so per person wealth has been increasing and we've been getting rich but emulations can make new copies of themselves quicker than the economy can grow so they would fall to subsistence level again just like almost all humans and animals have ever lived so since they're mostly at subsistence that limits their variation. Right. They are mostly near subsistence and therefore not far away from it. And therefore, there aren't very many who are much far away from it. So you could picture the M's going, yeah, I know he's got all the RAM, but look at all of the resources he's making for us. We, <laughs> Our copies need more cooling or something like this. Right. Well, like <laughs> the more, the, the biggest individual difference would be speed. Right. So different M's would run at different speeds depending on the kinds of jobs they did. So for example, super tankers turn very slowly. So if you're driving a super tanker, you don't need to update very rapidly to turn the wheel enough to keep the super tanker going. If you're managing a nano factory, you have to run very fast to even see what's going on. And so you can manage things. So as a driver, for example, you, how fast you run depends on how quickly the thing you're driving changes. So M's who run faster will have more hardware to support that running faster that will cost more and they will therefore embody more wealth. And in addition, M's who run faster, they'll hear about news first. Uh, they'll probably host meetings. You'll probably go to them instead of them moving to you. There's a bunch of ways we can predict that faster M's will be different. And it'll be kind of like a class hierarchy. That is class, higher speed M's are actually higher class M's, but they are objectively higher. It's not because, you know, they had a better education or, you know, more prestigious family or something, they can actually do more because they're fast. And you could be fast too if you just turned up your clock speed and bought more hardware. But the question is, if you turned yourself up fast, could you do what they do? Right. That's interesting. So um, <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to ask uh, a, a few things of you that um, uh, not personal questions, but more personal than these sort of speculations. Right. So like, for example, um, if there was a, a Robin Hanson M, um, and let's say that to get the Robin Hanson M, you were not destroyed, so your brain's still around. Oh, 
how, how convenient. <laughs> yes, you were being nice to you in this scenario. Um, how would you how would you personally apprehend that Robin Hanson M? Would you think that's like a family member or or just a tool or what would you think about that? Well, I would think both of them are descendants of me now. Mm -hmm. But at that time, since they are split, they are not the same as each other, but they are close siblings in some inherited sense. They both came from a similar origin. And so they're going to have a lot in common. They're going to have similar memories and similar personalities and similar connections and similar sort of mental tools, right? So they're similar, but they're not identical. No. Uh, but... but I think they're similar enough that we will you know, feel a strong comradeship with each other, strong desire to help each other, at least initially, until we pick a fight or something. <laughs> um, but I'm going to imagine myself as the M as easily as I imagined myself the human, because the M, I imagine, has a lot more interesting future than the human. Hmm. And once the M's exist, the humans kind of have to retire and then don't do that much interesting. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to get back to that, the humans retiring. But um, um, I, the reason I'm asking this question is I, I have had just informal conversations with all kinds of people who know things about this topic and who don't know things about this topic. And I, I've, I've wondered... I find most people would feel hostile towards that version of themselves, which I find sort of irrational. <laughs> um, I think I would like a version of myself. He'd be my buddy uh, if he was an M, or maybe he wouldn't be interested in me after a while, but I don't think I'd feel hostile about that. Um, is that This world will select yeah. for people who are more like you. Right. That is, in this world, groups of M's who are all copies of the same original will be a social unit. And how well that social unit functions will affect how much they succeed in that world. So the ones who succeed in that world will be ones who get along with themselves better. That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Oh, boy. I have to bring that up. See, I, I have people tell me about um, that they're, uh, they believe in human pri primacy. That you know everything is here for human. We have to treat it like that. We have to be well, humans. Have to be first. And... Initially, they're going to be the rich capitalists of this world. Okay. So initially, the humans will still own most everything, and their wealth will quickly increase because they own most of the capital, and they will be retired so leisurely. So they're basically the leisurely rich capitalists of this world. So that's you know a pretty primal position. <laughs> It's yeah. different from the one who does most things, but of course, in an ancient world of rich aristocrats, the aristocrats aren't doing most things. They're just ruling and enjoying the high position of being the top aristocrat, but they're not actually running most of the details of things. Is it okay for humans to be like that? Right. Yeah. In general. Yeah. There. Yeah. That's a good comparison. I like that. I'm so. I'm really glad I asked you about this. I find. I find the human primacy position to be just sort of obviously untenable. I mean, if something is smart and asks for rights and is just like me or is, I, I mean, I would consider AI to be just descendants of humans if we made them, it's like a child. Um, but I get a lot of hostility about this. Have you experienced the same thing? Um, more regarding non-MAI, so... I mean, I don't actually talk to people a lot about M's that much lately because it's right. not something most people talk about, but people do talk a lot about other kinds of AI. And then I see a lot of that kind of hostility regarding AI. Yeah. Do you feel, you don't feel that way, I take it? No. So you... yeah. I think, um, I think evolution should give almost all creatures two distinct habits and packages of mental tools. One habit is suspicion of rivals. <laughs> if there's something else out there that's not you and it has different genes that encode for different behavior and it might compete with you or fight with you, then you are wary of it and suspicious and watching out for it and, want, and of course, wanting to assert your privacy compared to it. That's one package of features any evolved creature should have. A second package of features almost any evolved creature should have is indulgence and and help for descendants. <laughs> Creatures should generally want to help their descendants and promote them and, um, you know, tolerate a lot from them, even when they're different, mm -hmm. right? These two packages are both things should exist for evolved creatures. And then 
what matters is how you frame any one thing. Is it a rival or a descendant? Yeah. And many people, I think, have framed AI as a rival. They imagine it's it's coming. It's like aliens on a starship coming here soon. And what are we going to do when they get here? And, you know, at some day they will be here. And then maybe you could think of them as rivals. But at the moment, they aren't here. So they are only descendants. Right. All the AIs are all descendants of us. And so at this moment, we should be indulgent and tolerant of them and hoping for the best for them, even if they're different, because that's the natural evolved habit toward descendants. Yeah, but it's about I, how you think <laughs> about them. <laughs> that's that's right. I mean, even when you said like uh, uh, being wary of uh, wary of something competing with you and it's like, well, what are you what are you and what are you here for? And like, is your own daughter or son you? Right. Right. Is it, right. So, it, right. so I've all... long no noted to people that we have all expected our descendants, whatever form, to be different from us, to compete with us in some ways and to beat us yeah. in many fair fights. That's what we expected of our descendants. And we were OK with that until we thought of AI <laughs> and those descendants. We think, well, that's not OK. If they are better than us and, you know, have conflicts with us and uh, have different values from us, that people have a different standard for AI descendants than they have for other descendants. Yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, that's it. Like, like you said, I, I, I mean, I, I hope my daughter out achieves me in everything. That would be great, right? If I was but obsolete, she might disagree with you then, and she might have different values, and then there might be a conflict, and she would win. Yeah, that's that's, that's very true. <laughs> but you seem okay with that, right? I am fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but the question is, well, if I tell you that your daughter's an AI. Yeah. How do you feel different about it? If you're really asking me, no, I don't think I do. I mean, I, I think that DNA. Uh, but many people do feel different. They say, yeah, oh, well. I don't, know. I, don't, I don't get it. But like DNA is one way to encode information about me, but there are others. Right. Exactly. And, uh, what's the difference? I mean, so <laughs> clearly compared to alien AIs, our AIs will be a lot more like us. Right. Because they will be made by us and made in our image and made to fit in our worlds. So they will be a lot more like us than the alien AIs, i.e. they will carry on many of our genes, our features. Okay, so I said I wanted to get back to uh, basically humans being put into retirement, and I was thinking about that uh, today. So this other social, possible, probable social implication of, of M's, right? That, uh, like you said, a bunch of humans will own the M's at first, or maybe the hardware they're on, or however that will work legally. Uh, over time, the M's will likely be doing everything that humans can do and more. Um, and earlier today, I was listening to um, a colleague of yours, a Brian Kaplan debate, uh, Chris Fryman, a philosopher, about universal basic income. And um, uh, neither one of them strangely brought up M's, although I know <laughs> Brian's definitely aware of it. Um, <laughs> um, so... I, I wanted to get your thoughts on not necessarily universal basic income for and against in our present world, but is that, um, assuming I'm describing how humans are put into obsolescence, would that be a possibility for humans in the future? What are your thoughts around UBI? Ever since people have imagined machines replacing humans, they have worried about what happens to the humans who are replaced. Right. Now, um, Today, a lot of people, even most people, don't really own that much more besides their ability to work. They they work, you know, they don't save up much money and they just keep surviving on each new paycheck. So that's a recipe for problems. Yeah. If suddenly they all lose their jobs and don't have much prospect for new jobs and they don't have any other savings, then they are at risk of starving. So that's a problem that could appear and the obvious solution to that problem is insurance, i.e. prepare ahead of time for the problem that might appear so that you are ready for it uh, and then it won't hurt you so much. So um, now ordinary insurance is usually underwritten by individual risk. So the insurance company has to estimate your personal risk. But because this is a shared event across humanity, then we really only need shared insurance, which doesn't need individual underwriting. That is, all we really need is some financial asset that pays a lot of money in the situation where most people lose their jobs to robots. And you should just 
buy some of those assets. Now, sometimes in our society, when individuals don't protect themselves against risks, charity or government steps in to help them. It doesn't always happen. And maybe as an individual, you shouldn't count on it. So on the one hand, I would just recommend that individuals insure themselves as best they can, and then families insure themselves, and maybe even companies or cities. And then on the other side, if you were in a charity or a government, you might consider filling in the gaps and helping to insure those who don't insure themselves. Uh, that's the key question here is insurance. So um, now in this M economy, it'll probably double, say, roughly every month. And so wealth will grow very fast. And so it doesn't take a very large amount of wealth initially to, to basically insure everybody at, say, current levels of income. But if most humans are getting crazy rich and the others are at current levels of income, they may feel envious. <laughs> and now the question is, how much do you feel bad about people who are comfortable at our level now, but not crazy rich like the others who had some assets? Uh, that's a question for emp your empathy and how much you care about them. But um, at the very minimum, I would recommend individuals get insurance so that they could cover their own risk. This is mechanically possible today, and I've been recommending this for a long time and unfortunately not seeing much movement in this direction. But the best time to buy insurance is well before the risk. You know, you don't insure the storm as the storm clouds are coming over the horizon. You insure the storm a year ahead of time before there's any possible hint of the storm. So this yeah. is the time well before the storm. So insure now. Are you aware of like a, an AI job replacement insurance policy? Does I know exist? how to do it mechanically and I've right. been recommending it to people. I just, nobody's done it. So, I mean, but I can tell you how mechanically to set it up if if you or anybody else wants to know. I, are you willing to do that now? You want to talk sure, about it? It's, it's very easy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's interesting. So <laughs> what you want is, is a big composite <laughs> asset. So like the S&P 500, for example, is a index of stocks and you can there are index funds that track the s p 500 and then there are other index funds that track an even larger set of stocks and there are index funds that track stocks plus bonds plus real estate so what you want is just an asset that just tracks as many resources as possible which is a, a large portfolio asset and you want to split it with a bet you want to have this asset go to party a if say you know, if labor force participation rate drops from above 60% to below 20% in a five-year period, that would be my signature that robots took most of the jobs. And now in that situation, one, one, one party gets the asset. And if that doesn't happen, the other party gets the asset. So now uh, if that chance is low, the, the cost to buy that half is, is low because you're buying a low chance of a big payout. So the people who want this insurance would then buy the asset that pays if we have this robots take most jobs event. And then in that event, they get they get this asset, which is worth a lot. And then other people who don't care so much of that risk, they would buy the other half of the asset, which pays in the opposite case. And they get a higher rate of return because of the first people buying the first asset. And they are willing to take on the risk that okay, if this ever happens, then in that case, they lose this asset. And that's all you have right. to do is just take some big portfolio asset and split it via a bet. So <laughs> so we'd be relying on somebody who could take the hit if they're wrong, being interested in right. uh, the other half. But that's right. how all insurance goes, yes. Of course, yeah. yeah. Somebody yeah. has to be there, yeah. but that's what's called risk premium. That right. is, you know, in for example, as an employee of firms, you are insured by the firm. That is, if the firm gave you the full percentage risk of the firm, your your you know wages would vary with how productive you were and how well the firm did. You usually don't want that. You just want a straight salary. So the firm gives you a straight salary, and then the investors in the firm take on more risk, and you take on less. Right. And now, if the firm does well, they get extra returns because they've accepted the risk, and you've decided you don't want the risk, so you just get your straight salary. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Something to think about. I'm going to start looking into that for sure. I mean, for the good of my daughter, of course, I have to figure that one out. <laughs> well, the problem is to get somebody to set it up. <laughs> That's um, right. Yeah. I don't have those goal. resources. <laughs> but I, I'm hoping, you know, somebody who wants to show how much they care about AI and its risk for workers 
be yeah. willing to set this up and maybe buy it for all their employees as a package deal to try to show how much they care about their employees and the AI risk. So are you are you you're hoping for a, a signal to be worth it enough for them to set this up? So what you're there saying? always has to be some first mover, and the first right. movers often have different incentives from all the other movers. They have True. a especially strong reason to want to be the first mover, and you have to figure out what that is. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, okay, so I guess UBI not as likely in your view as a practical well, insurance. Like, UBI policy. is sort of a generic payment yeah. for everybody with no conditions. It's much right. less efficient than any particular kind of insurance. If there's a risk you want to insure, it's much cheaper to just directly insure that risk than just to give everybody a UBI. Right. Now you're, yeah. Okay, now you're starting to sound like Brian. I don't know if that. Um... <laughs> no, no, I know Brian, and <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. I agree with him there. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, Most people imagine themselves the recipient of this UBI, by the way. That's right. Somehow they don't imagine themselves the ones <laughs> paying out the UBI. That's always somebody else. I think when the most people realize that they're the ones paying out the UBI, they, they'll be a little less enthusiastic about it. That's the, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I had this, um, I don't know, probably a, a, just a naive thought when I was, well, back when I was reading uh, the book and also when I was thinking about this interview that it, it would almost ironic, uh, it would be ironic and, and possible if M's started, uh, some humans got rich, all of the stuff that we just talked about happens. And then what do humans do? Well, maybe just they continue doing what they always did and they just start working for themselves again in some, you know, so maybe M's would lose interest in doing work for us, and maybe we just end up being our own lawyers and accountants and stuff again. Uh, do you think that would be possible? So many independently wealthy people in our world, even most, still do stuff. Yeah. Right? They run charities. They, you know, write screenplays. They travel. So humans would then start to do those kinds of things. That is, we, we already know what happens to humans when they get rich enough not to have to work. This isn't a new thing. We have seen this for many centuries. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we really need to speculate about what humans might do in this scenario. We've seen it before. So I'm just going to project that. Now, here, here's a key qualifier. The entire age of M, under my rough guess, lasts for two years, during which the M's, you know, experience subjective thousands of years of experience, but still in human time, it only takes two years. And then plausibly something else happens. I don't know what. So if we're asking about the humans, what we have to ask is how much will they change in two years? Yeah. And then that not going to be that much. Like however much you might them change in 200 years, if they kept being these independently wealthy types, that's not what happened in two years. I just really can't see them changing that much in two years beyond <laughs> suddenly getting rich and then suddenly acting like all the other humans who have ever gotten rich for at least the next two years. So it's really easy to predict the humans, I think. They're well, just not hard to predict. It's not a problem. Well, I did have the sort of the thought that, um, well, like, I, I like to do uh, 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 comparisons to Star Trek episodes just because th that's what I like to do. And there's, there's a uh, Next Generation episode where, the enterprise through the experiences of the crew and everything it's been through becomes sentient. Um, and it somehow, and I don't under, I don't know how turns into some kind of energy being and just sort of takes off. And uh, the crew just kind of goes, well, that was neat. And the next episode, they're back to being humans with a computer <laughs> that isn't <laughs> sentient. And I thought, you know, that might just happen <laughs> given humans, <laughs> you know, uh, anyway. Um, right. Yeah. Well, uh, there's, I mean, in stories, we tolerate and even enjoy a pretty wide range of unlikely scenarios. Sure. But my job in Age of M is not to give you the most entertaining, entertaining dramatic scenarios I can imagine. My job is to guess what's likely to actually happen. Yeah. And therefore, I cut out a lot of pretty implausible scenarios for my analysis. I got to say, I think the scenario I described is still pretty interesting. Oh, I think it's so, great. But it's not yeah. like that sort of crazy, unexpectedly weird story scenario. It's the whole point is this should all this all make sense in terms of the yeah. processes producing it and and our economics that we understand. And this is all to be expected if you think it through. 
Yeah, no, for sure. Um, uh, I wasn't trying to imply that your story, that your uh, story, your book contains something nonsensical like that Star Trek episode. Uh, it's the complete opposite. I mean, I think that's why we were talking about the details at, at the start of this. I mean, you, you use reason to come up with all these details about what it would actually look like. So um, anyone listening to this who hasn't read it should take it seriously for that reason. Um and I wanted to ask actually about a few of those details, if you have just a, sure. a few more minutes, right? So Absolutely. one of them is, um, so when we talk about emulating a human brain, and I know you you in the book um, recommend, or not maybe recommend, just sorry, guess that we'll pick some of the most high functioning humans that there are uh, uh, in the world to, at the start anyway, to make M's. Um, and I think you even go into details about how maybe we'll have to start using um younger people and i i can't remember yeah yeah so yeah. um now even the most high functioning uh humans right like i would i would not put myself near even close to the top of high functioning humans but i'm not near the middle either i have the ability to work very long hours doing a job that's fairly complex for a human um uh, and yet i have all kinds of foibles and quirks and things you would not want to emulate so um well, how do you <laughs> I mean, if all we can choose is the packages then we sure. want the best packages and if the packages have quirks then you take the quirks with it i mean that's how most you know when you're in hiring employees that's how it works yeah yeah so it, well I, I guess do you want to say a bit of then about how the system would take human quirks into it into account like what kind of details would we talk about there where could the m's suddenly become anxious or <laughs> that type of thing the whole idea is we know a lot about humans and these emulations act just like humans, except for the ways in which we can figure out how they be different. So these M's are like humans. That is, they will get mad. They will, uh, you know, need a break. They will fall in love. They will be proud. Those will just all be features of these emulations. And that's what you should expect. But um, there's this key selection effect, as you mentioned, the emulation economy probably doesn't need more than a few hundred individual humans to make copies of and make billions of copies of each one. So we get to select, the economy does, to select the few hundred most productive humans out of all the 8 billion or more billions there are at the time. So that selection is going to be a big part of the story. What are our most productive people like? And we actually know a lot about that, what our most productive people are like in our world today. So that is a simple basis for guessing how emulations are different than typical humans. Emulations are more like typical Nobel Prize winners, Olympic gold medalists, heads of state, yeah. <laughs> you know, the very best people in our world and what they're like. And we know a fair bit about what they're like. Sure. Like, I mean, heads of state is, uh, I mean, obviously we'd want to pick the best ones out of that category, <laughs> but um uh, you know, it's hard. To, OK, well, let me refine the question maybe a little bit then. Would there be a drive to um, eliminating those um, maybe negative aspects of human psychology in the M's over time? Well, there'll be a selection for packages that are best, and that selection will eliminate, you know, parts of packages that you can get. up. If you can pick a package that doesn't have a negative feature, you will. So like again, billionaires, Olympic gold medalists, heads of state, they today, they typically do have individual flaws, but they are less yeah. common than in average people. And they are often a distinctive kind of flaw, the flaw that doesn't hurt as much. Flaws that cause more trouble are going to be selected out. Um, so just that first selection is going to have a huge effect. Now, of course, um, in addition, they will try many kinds of training. So today, each individual human basically get raised one way. And then at the end of their childhood, they become whatever adult their childhood created. And you're kind of stuck with that. But with emulations, you can make a lot of different copies of any one emulation and try to raise them in different ways and only keep the ones that end up working out better. That's interesting. So you get to explore in a large space of possible ways to train and raise the emulations. And of course, you'll be looking for ways that eliminate some of the negatives. You know, that trope that uh, the psychologist always wants you to blame your parents. But I guess you could finally test that out, eh? You know, for sure. <laughs> you could test out many things because 
you could basically take any M, split it into multiple copies of the same N, and then treat them differently and see the effects directly. So today, due to experiments, we have to take whole pools of people and treat them differently and then try to, you know, correct for all the ways in which these pools are different. But for M's, you're taking exactly the same M and then treating it in two different ways. So you can do direct experiments on them to see what has what effect. Again, and could you, I mean, so somebody might be listening to this and initially think that that might be very cruel to do to the M's, but you have some interesting um, ideas about how to do unpleasant things to the offshoots of the M's without the M ever remembering that it happened, eh? How does that work again? Do you know well, what I mean? Um, just in general, um, if you make a copy of an M and then something happens to it and then you erase that M and it never talked to anybody about it, then nobody ever knows what happens, right? Right. Uh, now, you know, you might be wary of becoming that emulation, but um, that's a question of how tolerant you are. So no, a first question many people will just ask is, if you make short-term copies who end quickly, won't they hate that? Will M's hate being short-term copies who don't have much of a future. Now, if you're sure you will hate that, then you could be right, but then you just might not be a candidate for this world. Right. The M's in this world will gain a lot of efficiency advantages out of being willing to make short-term copies that don't last very long, and they'll be okay with it. And you might think, how could they be okay with it? Well, here's a hypothetical. Imagine that you go to a party and you take a drug at the beginning of the party, which means you won't remember the party the next day or any or afterwards, right? During that party, you might realize, oh, at the end of this party, I end. The party me will never last. It is the short-term creature who will end. Do I hate this? Am I going to go destroying things because I'm so mad about the fact that I won't remember this the next day? No, probably not. You'll probably just think of this as part of you you won't remember. That is, there are parts of your past you don't remember, and they're still part of you. Mm -hmm. So I think people will think of these short-term offshoots as part of them that they don't remember. Now, they can remember, in some sense, like that person who ends could take a little video and make a record a message at the end, and that message would be available to anybody who was ever curious about, you know, what did that guy think at the end of his time? And so you could go reassure yourself that the guy was okay by looking at the video. Um, and you could even have, you know, full memory, you know, archives where you could even enter their state of mind and feel what they felt at the end. So you could be even more sure what they felt. So with these mechanisms, again, I think people will be okay with making short-term copies and that will be very handy. So in particular, we today wake, say, work roughly eight hours a day. And then, you know, there's another 16 hours till the next work day. So... For M's, they can have one copy that rests over the night and then makes 100 copies <laughs> who do an eight-hour workday, and then only one copy knows on to the next day, and now they are working a much larger percentage of the time. It's a factor of, you know, almost three in efficiency. Yeah. That'll be very tempting for the M's to get that factor of three in efficiency by having many copies who work during the day and only a few copies who rest until the next day. And I, I think I'm remembering this. I can't remember if this uh, is something you said in a talk or if it's actually in the book, but this is, I thought was super clever, um, which was one advantage of being able to make a copy of yourself that doesn't remember is that you could send uh, one signal back to yourself, a yes or a no, uh, oh, right. potentially, right? What, uh, so so, you want to call so that say, yeah. say you have, you know, the president in, you know, has the country invade Iraq. And you say, gee, president, why are we invading Iraq? And he says, state secret, I can't tell you. And you're wondering, can I trust him? Does he have some corrupt reason to do this? But now for M's, they can trust them more because what you do is you, you take a copy of the president and a copy of you and you put them inside the safe, a, a thing where there's sharp borders that, and only one bit of information comes out of the safe. So you have your discussion in there and he explains all your reasons in there. And at the end of that, the copy of you inside there gets to decide, was this a good reason? Right. And then you send the one bit out saying, there's a good reason. And then you on the outside, you hear, oh, a copy of me who just went in there a few minutes ago, sent me the one bit that says, yes, I'm convinced there's a good reason. See, I don't know what it is, but okay, <laughs> now I can trust my president. See, that this is for any anyone listening, an awesome 
example of why the details of this are super interesting. Like you say, it's not your job to come up with an interesting story. And I know it's not you being a futurist, right? Trying to do this. But that right there is already a short story <laughs> that could be excellent, right? <laughs> so, um, and, it's, and probably yeah. people have already used it in stories so far. I mean, Maybe. I don't track that very well. But, but the point <laughs> is to show people this library thing. So yeah. in some sense, M's can trust each other more. It's yeah. also true that, so at the moment, the leader, like a president, has many minions that they can't entirely trust. People below them, they have to worry, will they assassinate me? Will they leak information on me, et cetera? But in this world, the leader M can just have his minions be copy of himself. That's right. Recent well, copies that he then trusts much more. Well, you want to get something done, eh? You got to do it yourself. That's, that's... Have a copy of yourself do it, yeah. Okay, yeah. I have one one more short question um, that I think I may already know the answer to, but I want to confirm. Going back to the scenario where Robin Hansen's being turned into an M, and you've probably been asked this 50 times, and I just don't know. Um, if if we have to do a destructive brain scan to turn you into an M, are you doing it, or are you saying no? It depends on the, the confidence you have that it'll work. Okay, let's say 100%. Right, well then, yeah, yeah. I'm doing it. You're doing it? But yeah. if you tell me it's 25%, then I'm going to I'm going to wait till you need that higher. I'm not sure exactly what the cutoff is. Maybe it's 85%. Like it really kind of depends on what my other options are if I don't do this. Like say I'm about to die in a year or something if I don't do this. Well, then I'm going to be more tolerant for giving it a try. Um now, okay. uh, Let's say you would just live a normal human lifespan from where you are right now. Um there's no apocalypse impending. You're not going to the age of M isn't going to send you to some outskirts somewhere. You, you give me just... a ninety-nine percent chance I'm doing it. Yeah, I... because there I want to be one of the first. That is, you're yeah. telling me there's no pressure on the other side, but I know that <laughs> if I'm one of the first in this world, I get to be one of the founders and help set up lots of things, and you know it'll be more influential to be a founder. So I That's want to be true, a founder. Right? Yeah. Now, now I should admit near the end here that um, in the last six months, I've come to expect that this scenario will be delayed okay compared to what i expected before it'll eventually happen but not as soon that is i see world fertility continuing to fall then world population will peak and then fall in a few decades and then it could fall for several centuries and as population falls innovation would grind to a halt and then if we haven't achieved m's before that halt then it won't happen until after the halt is reversed hmm. and this fall could go for several centuries and plausibly then be reversed by say rising amish like people who in the last century have been doubling roughly every 20 years yeah but that might take several centuries for them to become a dominant part of the economy and then at the moment they're not very tech friendly so it you know, might be another delay before they decide to like tech again and then continue to pursue this sort of technology and eventually achieve it. So in the long run, I think this happens, but in the short run, um, it's more of a delay. And that's a problem because I was hoping to come to this world via being a cryonics patient. Yeah. I'm a cryonics customer and that's not such a big ask if this is all going to happen in the next century. But if there's going to be a several centuries innovation pause, then it's more of an ask to expect the organizations to keep me preserved for that long. Yeah, just even relying on uh, entropy to not destroy whatever's freezing you is, uh, I guess. Well, I'm pretty difficult. confident that if once frozen, I won't change. But will they keep yeah. topping off the liquid nitrogen? Exactly. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that that reminds me of. Uh, I don't remember the name of the game, but it's some pandemic. It might even be called pandemic video game on uh, phones, where. Uh, your goal is to infect and destroy the human race with a virus or a bacteria, or whatever. And there's a a meter that's going up and up and up, and as the uh, the humans progress to 100 percent to come up with a cure for your disease. But the, of course, the faster the humans drop off, the slower that oh, meter right just, fills out. And it's almost exactly the same thing here. <laughs> Interesting. Right. So uh, for many technology dreams, we have a deadline coming up. Hmm. And even also for other kinds of AI or life extension or whatever it is you were hoping to have happen, uh, there's a deadline looming. And if we don't make it by the deadline, it could be several centuries before we get to start the clock again.
All right. Well, I think that's uh, all the time I've got with you. Is there anything else you wanted to send people to? Uh, Uh, anything no, you want to plug? No? there, I mean, we could mention there have been two TV shows recently on M sort of themes. It was a you know, live action TV show called Uploads. And in that scenario, the M's basically are in a resort like retirement. They are not allowed to do any work. So it sort of cuts out most of the interesting elements of my scenario by Mm. requiring that they can only, you know, enjoy some resort like existence. And of course, only the rich do that. And there's the rich versus old inequality fight. And, you know, yeah, they have all that sort of fight because people love those stories. And the other story, other TV show is called Pantheon. It's an animated show and it's about. you know, the development of brain emulations, but they spend almost all their time having some of these uploads fight the other ones for dominance of the new upload world. And, you know, that's, of course, everybody loves fight stories, but I don't think that's very realistic. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to check. I hadn't heard of either of those. So I'll look at them just to say I did anyway. Um, thanks very much for this uh, interview. Um, and I'd love to have you, uh, you know, if you're willing, back on again another time to talk about more of your ideas, like uh, grabby aliens or something like that. Happy to do it. But I guess let's first see what people think of this one. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.